listening to episode 146 of Mida Life Radio. I am Matt Blackburn, and today we're speaking with Allison Policier. Allison founded the Traveling Light Machine Project and has been sharing the Lucia light experience for several years with people at various events, retreats, festivals, etc. Being a supplement and gadget guy, I've always been fascinated with different health technologies, and I'd come across this in my research over the past decade, but it wasn't until about three years ago that I had the chance to use one, and it was at a sensory deprivation flotation center, and I was really blown away with how it made my brain and my nervous system feel I was in a really stressful time in my life. I was keto. I was pretty much vegan. It was my wildest experiment, one meal a day. And at the same time, I was living with someone that was super toxic. I was working with someone that was super toxic. And I felt an immediate grounding effect and really a feeling to my nervous system that everything is going to be okay. And now that I have my own Lucia home unit, I can say the feeling is the same. That is, if I use it long enough. In this interview with Allison, I learned a lot of things that I shouldn't have been doing, like using lyrics and not doing long enough sessions to get the full effect. So in this interview, Allison talks about how she got into this therapy, hypnagogic light therapy, her experience with insomnia, uh, PTSD, nightmares, trauma, and how using this technology, this light therapy, helped her to process a lot of that and really turn her life around. And now she's passionate about sharing that with others and maybe too passionate. Alice and I were laughing. We were having so many technical difficulties. And she was saying how she'll often affect technology with her energy, which I don't think is too out there because we definitely generate an electromagnetic field that can interact with computers and mess them up. I've experienced it. And so I give that context because if it sounds choppy, Um, That's why, because I had to piece together this interview because it kept breaking up. Uh, It could be because she's all the way in Bali, or it could be that she was just so excited that her electromagnetic field kept frying the computer and making it wonky. (laughs) And we know that we're electromagnetic photonic beings, and there's this symphony between electromagnetism, light, and water. It's happening at a deep level in our cells and in our plasma. And I think that's really the key to health. And I think that's where technologies like this have a profound systemic effect on our physiology. So whenever you input beneficial light into the system, the body can take that and use it to organize, structure itself, and optimize uh, cellular functions. So here we go. Here is Allison Policier. All right, we're here with Allison Policier. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, yeah, I'm really excited for this one. Um, I bought one of your your home units earlier this year, and. I've tried different flashing lights at various health conferences over the years, and uh, I think one at a a sensory deprivation uh, flotation spa. I used that before floating, and that was really cool. And I've always just been um, fascinated with it. And um, I, I finally got to a place financially where I can actually get my own home unit. And I've been studying circadian rhythm for years and light therapy and how light affects not only our skin, but our blood and our hormones and everything as you all know like light is like the master uh controller and so so i thought uh your technology would be really cool to 
to integrate into my um, daily routine, like to get my brain going to start the day. Uh, if it's overcast out, which it often is here in Idaho, and uh, it's just been incredible. So yeah, thanks for for sharing this with the world. Yeah, absolutely. So great to have you on board. So have you been doing sessions every day yourself? <laughs> every day, yeah. And I'll have some questions for you during the show because I'm not sure if I'm doing it right. <laughs> I usually put on uh, Spotify, you know, my phone next to me, and I'm so sensitive. And I think when I started, you helped me a little bit. Um, and you recommended the clouds one, which is a pretty light one. But usually I've just been doing like the welcome medium, uh, which is like, I think, five minutes or something, three to five minutes. Um, I don't know if I'm getting a, enough of an effect, though. I, I was wondering if you need to do it. If, if 20 minutes is kind of like a sweet spot minimum or something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we can talk about <laughs> there's there's so many. And that's what's kind of exciting about the technology as well. It's a it's a tool that not only evolves with you as you grow and you change, but there's so many different ways to work with it. So I'm doing little short sessions to so doing longer sessions and in different kind of correlations of reported benefits as well. Awesome. Yeah. So before we jump into that, um, how did you get interested in this whole thing and the effect of uh, flashing lights? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I guess I'll start by saying that I've always been interested in in lights and flashing lights and sunlight. You know, being from Colorado, I've always just been like, wow, the sun, you know, I can just sit out in the sun. And, you know, even if you just lay in the grass and the sun or you maybe have a tree above you and kind of the winds blowing gently and you start getting this kind of feeling of, you know, and seeing some, a little bit of patterning and coloring. I was, I was always really into that and, you know, driving in Colorado in the mountains and the car as a kid, we would go past all the Aspen trees and I would close my eyes and like be right by the window and, you know, get the effect of this kind of like flickering sensation. So for me, there's always been this kind of, visceral interest in light and like understanding of how it makes me feel and what I perceive from it. Um, but I really wasn't looking for it when I found the Lucia. I was studying um, international education and development and kind of going in the how I can help the world um, through my master's degree. And I was going through my own um, process of getting through some some deep trauma um, that had emerged from my childhood. And, you know, like so many people, we kind of repress a lot of things that happen in our childhood. Um, and then at a certain point, when our psyche decides we're ready to <laughs> start diving in, things start coming up. So I was in, in that process myself and I was having a lot of like nightmares and kind of classical PTSD symptoms of these things occurring in my consciousness, but I was also like one of those people that's like, I'm fine. I'm, I don't need like help, you know, like psychiatrists are for weak people. And like all these, I had a pretty like hard edge, you know, there of like being so proud I had made it through into life. So I definitely wasn't looking for healing. Let's say that much. And, um, I went to, but a friend of mine invited me to a gallery where there was a light experience. And for me, that was more compelling, you know, this kind of artistic side of like, ooh, some kind of art with light. Like, and I felt really compelled to go. So I ended up um, going kind of last minute. And then when it was my turn um, to go into the tent that they had it set up, and I had no idea that what I was going to experience, but what I ended up experiencing was really profound. And I went through kind of a deep internal journey, almost similar, you know, very similar to a kind of a psychedelic experience uh, without psychedelics and reconnected some pieces from my past, had a visit with my dad who had passed away and all these different things kind of like clicked into place in this one journey. And after that journey, um, I slept for the first time in eight months. And if you know, or if you've ever been through a period of insomnia or currently in one, which is many people, you're not alone. And for those of us who have experienced that, the sense of like actually being able to sleep is one that is life changing. I mean, it's amazing when you're really running on such little sleep for so long and then you have a chance to sleep. It's just like, oh my God, like life is different. Like, you know, like everything I'm perceiving is completely changed. And so, of course, I mean, not surprisingly, I was like, what just happened to me? You know, what was that experience? I mean, it's one thing to have this kind of like deep, powerful kind of integration and experience. But there's also a way that our psyche 
kind of can dismiss those experiences as being like, oh, okay, that was that was cool, but you know, like we don't need to keep doing these earth shattering changes around here. Like, you know, <laughs> let's restabilize at the new normal, and this feels great, you know. But but something about the physical actually of being able to sleep was in combination with this incredible like visionary kind of experience really got me interested and. Um, so I started digging deeper into this world of light and actually ended up getting my own light system within a year. I was like having dreams about it. It was obviously clearly, you know, part of my path and then ended up kind of doing the deep dive into the, the light world. So that was kind of my entrance. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Wow. Yeah, I know a lot of people were dealing with insomnia and I've been there where you just feel like you just can't get rid of those recurring thoughts, whatever they are. And maybe they're just unconscious. You don't know what the recurring thoughts are, which is more frustrating. And it's preventing, it's just keeping you tense and you can't fully relax. And I know I've, I've listened to interviews, um, other interviews with you about the light. And you say that the Lucia light allows you to, to let go. Right. And it's kind of a, it's like a facilitator of letting go. And it's a process that's like never ending kind of helps you with that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, again, there's no, you know, I always like to say too, there's never like a one stop shop for everything, you know, like, I don't want anyone listening to be like, Oh, my God, I have insomnia, I have to buy this light now and change my life. You know, it's not, it's not really how it works. I mean, there's always a lot of factors involved in everything that we do, as we spoke about before the interview of how interrelated all these systems are. But really, like this ability to let go is definitely linked to, um, you know, kind of hyperactivity in the brain, which is like also so, you know, anxiety, when you characterize it's anxiety, it's this hyper awareness with this, you know, mental heightened state. Um, and then also not being able to sleep or insomnia, trouble winding down, trouble meditating, trouble kind of getting into these states. And it's, you know, this type of hyper arousal is uh, a mechanism of the body of protection, you know, like everything that our body does or these states that we go into, it's it's our body trying to help us, you know, so it's, a, it's also helpful to remember to not try to punish ourselves or our body or, you know, it's easy to just get angry and be like, why is it like this? You know, or, but really it's just, it's, it's a mechanism of attempting to help. So I like to think of it as almost like these kind of like children personalities of our body that are like, hi, I'm really sweet and I'm, I'm here to help. And you're like, okay, that's, that's nice. But you know, it, that's not actually helping anymore. Maybe at some point, at some point that worked, but, um, you know, that's not really, really helping any longer. So being gentle with ourselves and with these processes is a, is a big help into that. And, um, you know, and, and a tool that can really assist in, in this process of letting go is, is definitely those. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I'm glad you say, said that about the silver bullet. Cause that's, that's a good point. I, I sell supplements and I have to reiterate that over and over again to let people know that it's kind of a combination of everything that gives the effect, not just one one thing substance or device or whatever um have you dove into like the circadian rhythm aspect of this because I, I i keep meditating on that with your light how much of it is that because i remember learning that um ocular melatonin is what we produce from the stimulus of bright light at the start of the day and the you know blue blocking glasses are really big right now and trending which i think they should be they're helpful but the first side of that equation is getting really, really bright light <laughs> in your eyes in the morning to be able to make melatonin in the darkness at night. And that's how I've been like loving your device. And I definitely am getting more deep sleep and more REM sleep. Like I've been using the R ring on airplane mode. And it's like my sleep just gets higher and higher the more I use your light. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, the kind of theories of ocular melatonin and bright light stimulation early in the morning is definitely super powerful. And I think that, again, you know, there's combined elements. That's definitely one element. But it's fascinating because, like, in my case, for example, it was deep in the evening that I had this light experience that allowed my deep sleep to happen. So my perspective is kind of that there's a combination of things happening here, obviously, probably even more than I understand. Um, but one side is this, yes, melatonin regulation that, you know, when our nervous system is in stress and we're in a traumatic state, um, we're in this hyper arousal and it doesn't allow the nervous system to get into um, the sympathetic, which is really like allowing, you know, rest and digest is the kind of classic understanding of um, 
I'm sorry, the parasympathetic uh, mm -hmm. system. The sympathetic is the activation and then the parasympathetic is the rest and digest. So it doesn't allow movement um, between those two states. And so without getting into this like parasympathetic state, I believe that's a directly connected to the melatonin regulation because if you're not feeling safe enough to sleep on this kind of primal level, then why would you release melatonin as something that's going to induce sleep, you know? So I think the body is kind of like, we're not in a safe zone. Like we can't get into a deep sleep right now. This could be dangerous, you know, like stay alert. Um, and so I think those two are closely related. And so, you know, a lot of people ask like, oh, should you experience the light in the morning or at the night time? And, you know, it really depends. It's like, when is this kind of stressful point for you? Um, it can be really helpful for, you know, with depression or kind of like sad, you know, seasonal affective disorder, we're not getting a lot of uh, bright light in general, like from the sun to really start the day with a Lucia light session. Um, for other people that, you know, have bright light accessible, you know, in your day, then I would still recommend the sun. You know, I don't think this is, you know, any of these technologies are a replacement for the amazing bounty of nature and how we're really connected to that cycle. So, if possible, definitely get out into the into the sun in the early mornings, watch the sunrise, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, to get the brain kind of going um, the and, you know, this bright light in the morning, especially if it's cloudy, overcast, things like that, then the Lucia light can be super helpful. But yeah, I think that the sleep overall is more related to being able to get the system into the parasympathetic. And then I think that correlates with the, the melatonin release. Mm. And the deeper one is like a dorsal vagal, right? Like the frozen state, which a lot of people are in, <laughs> just like beyond like sympathetic. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and so that's, you know, getting into more of the iterations of the of the nervous system and, you know, polyvagal theory of bringing in the, the vagus nerve and how actually we have, you know, the vagus nerve being, you know, a branch of the parasympathetic and understanding that instead of just, um, you know, there's kind of this uh, social state that we're in, you know, and this brings in the whole anxiety thing, right? If we don't feel safe, and, you know, there's all these different cues and I do more talks about the nervous system in specific, but we look around for safety, like as everyone around us also calm and, you know, centered, okay, then I can relax on that level. But if you don't know anyone, you know, you're in a big crowd of unknown people, then even, you know, like calm faces can look angry and aggressive and you start getting scared, you know, so this is, can bring you into um, a very uncomfortable state of anxiety. But then, yeah, once people have on the other hand, if you've gone through so much deep like trauma or overwhelm, you can just get into a numb state and that's total like frozen shutdown. And, you know, wow, like my, my heart really goes out for people like that because that's, you know, it's a, it's a challenging time. But if you think about it like seasons, you know, weather, this is like winter, you know, this is a time of you know, internal work of like really being warm inside, you know, like, like, oh, okay, I'm like in winter. So like can start bringing spring, you know, like, oh, yeah, some light, you know, but maybe not too intense, you know, maybe sensitive light or like, you know, even working with sound and doing kind of more gentle things to start really waking up the system. And then moving from the spring, which is like, okay, I'm starting to want to socialize and things, but I'm still getting overwhelmed, you know, then it's like, okay, then we can start bringing in more, you know, I think then the light is really helpful in, the, in this, uh, you know, spring state of, um, you know, working with the nervous system. And then, you know, even in summer where you're like, okay, everything's going well, but you know, I want to maintain my balance. Um, then the light is also super helpful. So I think it, the Lucia works with you through the different kind of like seasons of, you know, our wellness and, and we all go through them, you know, it's not like mm -hmm. where people are exempt and even people have done tons of work on themselves, like still have periods of different challenges. So it's just important to keep in mind as well. <laughs> yeah, those are really good points. I've been delving into like the attachment theory. I have friends that got me onto some really cool books about that. Like I think Waking the Tiger and Peter mm -hmm. Levine, I think, and there are some other good ones. And um, I think there's a lot of talk of like, you know, self-love and working on yourself but we sometimes forget like working with a partner or community or, like human interaction could be so healing you know and like building secure attachments with people definitely so important <laughs> actually like fundamental importance you know one of the most challenging 
you know, aspects of this whole COVID situation for so many people actually has really been the isolation element, right? And, you know, it's actually what's, oof, I just got chill talking about that. But, you know, even just knowing like that, um, our nervous, like we get so used to things so quickly too. So like if you're home alone and you're not really having interactions with people, you know, the, the problem is that it's like we get used to it. So we kind of like stabilize in a lower state of like, it's like deep stress, but we don't even realize we're stressed, you know, and then any interaction, it's going to be like spiking fear and like overwhelm, you know? So it's like yeah. things like the Lucia, but then also just engaging with people in person, ideally that you really feel safe with can start building that stability again. So I really recommend people like, yes, getting close, doing the work with each other and being able to be seen and supported in community is like, just, you can't, you can make that up in any other way. We're social creatures at the end, you know, even if you consider yourself an introvert, like, you know, being seen and loved by your community is, is a big important role like in our lives. So. Yeah. Yeah. I've tried just to uh, only social media. It's so much easier. I don't have to deal with people's crap, but it's, it only works so long. And then you need that face to face. And I've had almost psychedelic experiences. This was like a couple of years ago where, you know, you just get lost in research and the screen and then you have an actual human interaction. It's like, wow, this feels like a video game. That's not, re- that's not good. <laughs> you know, it's like real life feels virtual. <laughs> that's when you know you have a problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, like so many people right now, right? Because that's the safe thing and everything. So I think as we start to reemerge from this cocoon state, it's just like, wow, look how incredible and you know, we have a chance, actually, all of us to see how much more intuitive we are and aware of energy we are, because there is that contrast, you know, of being like, okay, being online versus seeing someone in person and like, wow, I can really feel when their energy is changing, or I can notice things. And, and so it's a, it's a beautiful moment to like, recognize our intuition increasing. Yeah, yeah. And the, the nonverbal communication has been fascinating for me, like, like I have a GDV camera here, like the BioWell, you know, the little measures your photons coming off your fingertips, like the UV light. And, uh, you know, we're electromagnetic beings, but also photonic beings. And there's information stored in those things, right, that we transmit to other people. It probably is a lot more than words. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And to go really esoteric, I mean, it's, it's funny because I'm, I'm in Bali right now. And so everyone here is like pretty far, uh, you know, in the... You know, it's like I have to be like, oh yes, coming back because I, I, I'm really someone who sees lots of different perspectives. I'm not really like, oh, it's all this or it's all that. It's like, ooh, I'm very curious about all these different ways of looking at things. And you know, like a lot of people here really, you know, call it like changing light codes and things like that. And you know, at some hand, it like can sound really out there, but when you think about it, it's like yes, all like information is stored in light. Right. And so like what information is being reflected? We're all beings of light emitting light. Like we can understand that on a scientific level. And, you know, the frequency that's encoded and the light that we are emitting is basically like so many layers of like, what, what are you giving off? Like when you walk in a room, you know, like, what are you like, what are people seeing? And, you know, of course they're going to see through their own filter, but there's also you know, if you see someone amazing, that's like so inspiring in person and you're like, wow, like, yes, you pick up something from that, you know, whether it's, and that, that's the light code that you're receiving from them. So when we, you know, it's just a kind of <laughs> a spiritual way to think, <laughs> but really we're exchanging uh, information all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, you can really break it down scientifically. Like, I think I just got the book Light Shaping Life. And it gets so, it's a little over my head, but, um, you know, substances absorb and emit light, like even the cytochromes in our cells. I was just talking to one of my colleagues, mentors, and he was talking about, I think cytochromes four has like a red relationship and a blue relationship. And, you know, um, yeah, anyway, (laughs) that's a whole rabbit hole, but, um, I feel like your, your device helps kind of create that coherency um, and, you know, as long as there's a nutritional foundation and good water and all the other stuff with it. Um, but I think it could be a great adjunct to it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So to kind of get into the basics of how the Lucia light works for people who are just like, what are they talking about? Um, <laughs> with kind of the basics. So the Lucia light is a, 
like a specific type of light machine. And there's other ones actually on the, on the market right now, but the Lucia light is really kind of the best. And, you know, and, and the reason it's the best is because it uses two types of light sources, you know, which is a halogen bulb and led bulbs. And so the two different types of light sources create a wider spectrum of light. And, you know, as, anyone knows who's been researching into like blue light and you know red light and why we pick different parts of the spectrum for different times of the day having the halogen really makes um it's the you know much closer to the sun shall we say than just doing leds which are at a very limited spectrum and they're only kind of flickering so the lucia opens most of the sessions with just the solid light and so you're laying under it you have your eyes closed and um, the solid light starts, and this is kind of the, the seasonal affective disorder, you know, bright light therapy kind of aspect of like this bright lights coming in, it's solid light. There's actually a little visceral warmth from the halogen as well, which um, reminds us of, uh, you know, the sun itself and this kind of remembering of, you know, being around even a fire, there's a sense of warmth. So there's this kind of primitive connection there to, um, something really powerful of like, oh yes, like something comforting and secure. And then the flickering starts. And so the reason that flickering light is involved is because it helps drive the brain waves in, in the brain. And while, so, and then this brings, and so it takes us into different states of consciousness. And the goal of the Lucia light is a little different than kind of typical brain wave entrainment, so to say, which the Lucia light is actually, the programs are designed to take you into more coherent states of consciousness. And, and so this brings an interesting point because a lot of people are like, oh, you know, there's a you know, alpha state, there's a beta state, we're in beta right now, we're talking, exchanging information, you know, using the mind a lot to generate what we want to share here. Um, and then, you know, you can get into like the, you know, beta state, which people associate more with like dreaming and kind of this dreamy world and then delta, which is more like deep sleep. So there's a lot of, and gamma, which has, like really high you know frequency so there's a lot of different kind of general brain wave states but when it comes down to it it's almost like pop science to just say oh now i'm in this state or i'm in that state because we have so many different regions of our brain and actually at any given moment like they're in different you know states and there's all the the brain waves are oscillating at the same time it's like this crazy cacophony of sound you know that's coming from like all of these different waves happening simultaneously in the brain so to really say, oh, it takes me to the theta state is like such a, a gross simplification. But we can definitely say that the flashing light does change what's happening within these brainwave states in the brain. And what the Lucia light is designed for and the neurologist who designed it is really Dr. Dirk Prockel um, was really seeing about how we can get into more coherence within between different parts of the brain in the brainwave state. So it's like, when you're listening to a piece of beautiful music where all of the, you know, instruments are, you know, in harmony or like people singing, but all the voices are in harmony. There's just like this, ah, like feeling that we have, you know, and when we're in the flow state and we're just doing something with so much passion and love, we're in the same kind of like, ha, ah, like this is, this is it. You know, I don't have to think everything's just happening. Everything's flowing. Like, oh, I need that. There it is. You know, oh. I want that. There it is. Or that's even better than I expected. You know, when we're in those states, everything just flows. And so the Lucia lights more about guiding us to finding our own coherent states of consciousness. And that's through relaxing the nervous system and taking us through the series of different like frequencies. And so sometimes, so each session has kind of different layout of frequencies and again the idea is to get out of the left brain of like oh i want to analyze what the frequencies are and and make a correlation from that but more like choose a name of a session based off of you know the intensity that we feel ready for in that moment and then just like when we're choosing a piece of music we are choosing like oh do, am i in the mood for something you know, like, and different people choose like different things, you know, if you're going for like hard rock, maybe that gets people excited or some people want like side trans to get like motivated, you know, like other people would be like, Oh, that's horrible. Like they just give me some acoustic jams right now, you know? So we can, we can choose different sessions based off kind of like the feeling state that we're ready to move more towards, but um, it's not going to specifically change us in one way. And so mm. 
yeah, long story short, the light turns on, solid light, flickering light starts happening, different brightness levels. You start seeing these beautiful fractal colors and everyone has a different experience, which is really fun. Different every time you do it because your brain's in a different place every time. And um, yeah, and after a while, like for some people, it's kind of like a roller coaster. There's a there's a little bit of um, excitement in the beginning from uh, like the whole body because it's receiving so much light. So there's like, woo, you know, the heart rate actually goes up a little bit. There's this um, a little bit of kind of adrenaline can be released uh, initially for a lot of folks, um, especially if you haven't experienced it uh, many times before. And then as the flickering light starts becoming like rhythmic. So if you imagine like you know, why do we rock a baby or why do we, you know, like playing a drum, like shamanic drumming. It's like this rhythm kind of is so soothing for our system that we are able to really start relaxing. So even though it's a little intense at first, it starts taking us into this super relaxed state. And, um, and this process of going from a little bit of stimulation into this like controlled kind of slower relaxation is super healing for the the nervous system because it's saying like hey even if something intense happens it's still okay we can still relax you know and and so it's it's super healing in that way and usually by the end of the session if you do the longer one then you feel super relaxed so generally the 20 minute sessions are designed for getting you into this state of of deep relaxation Whereas, you know, the, the shorter sessions can be really great for this little, like, whoop, like, that's great in the morning, do three minutes, like, good morning, you know, a little um, <laughs> excited blast of light um, or, you know, you're like working on something for a while and you're like kind of stuck or like, you know, maybe a little antsy, you know, we can only focus for so long. So it's like, okay, I'm going to stop and take like a short break with, um, for a few minutes, you know, that can be really great. Um as well to kind of clear the mind. But in terms of really getting into this relaxed nervous system state, then the longer sessions are are recommended. And and so what happens over time is kind of like our uh, baseline of stress. You know, that's kind of like how you're feeling in the morning when you wake up, you know, and it's like, are you like, oh, like the anxiety coming in immediately? Like, you know, I was planning an event recently and I was just like, oh, wow, I haven't had this for a while. It's kind of fun because it was like it's not like that usually anymore but um I was like waking up immediately with these thoughts like oh did I do this did this person write back to me what's happening with that you know and it's like if you're feeling that in the morning then your your baseline level of stress is actually pretty high you know it means that there's there's a lot going on there you know and and it's okay again it's just um something to be aware of and it's like okay if you're feeling that way and starting in the beginning of the morning then it's like what are these tools that we can start bringing it down like um so yeah the, you know and float tanks there's so many different ways so lucia is just one option you know people get upset about how expensive it is like oh you're trying that and it's like it's just one option like there's so many options you know you can start the day by like laying in the grass with the sun i mean that's also free like you know you could choose whatever you want we're definitely not trying to like sell you something or force something for you this is just one type of experience that can be helpful for the nervous system and and so, yeah, it, it can really help with kind of lowering that baseline of stress. Um, and then when we start from a lower baseline, our creativity levels, our, you know, ability to empathize with others, our openness um, to, you know, change, like all of these factors start really showing up. And then even just like our reactivity levels start going down. You know, so um, and then in turn, that just invites synchronicity into our lives. It invites flow into our lives. It invites, um, you know, when we're able to be more present, we're able to see the possibilities. You know, sometimes there's all these possibilities are there. We just don't notice them because we're so busy rushing to the next thing. You know, it's like so um, it just allows us to unfold into who we are, which is really like this present unfolding magic. Like time isn't, you know now it's like now is this ever continuing moment that's unfolding so it just allows us to be more with with the unfolding in a sense of peace rather than this like you know mind rush to the next thing wow that was a great explanation i thought it was just stimulation you're like it's kind of how i've been using it but i guess i have to use it longer to get that relaxation effect um and i'm sure it's cumulative 
Um, one of the things I was fascinated by from one of your talks was um, the whole epilepsy thing, because I'm sure that's one of the most frequently asked questions you get. Like, you know, oh, just looking at it, I start to feel like I'm going to have a seizure or something. And I think in one of your interviews, you said, um, like the Mohammed, like the prophet, um, he like wrote the, was it Quran uh, after having a bunch of seizures or something? Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's, it's so, it's an interesting topic, <laughs> epilepsy, because there, there's, there's so much fear collectively around, um, having a seizure. And I think the fear really stems from the fact that, you know, when someone is having a seizure, you can't connect with them. You know, we feel so safe again, right? When we can connect, we look someone in the eye and we see them and they see us and we recognize that they can see us. When someone's having a seizure, they can't see you and their body is out of control. And so these are kind of like, you know, also being out of control, right? These are kind of the main fears, I think. Of, you know, so um, yeah, a seizure is really just kind of like an overwhelm of the system and, yeah. So there's, and then there was this one um, show, I guess, like a Pokemon episode or something years ago in Japan that was aired and it had this like epic, like scene with all these flashing lights and like tons of people had seizures, like watching it. And, you know, a lot of them were children and that's why I don't really recommend working with the Lucille with children, because when your brain's developing, you have a, a higher potentiality to have a seizure because Again, it's just kind of looking at it as an overwhelm of the system, right? So people have ep like light sensitive epilepsy, which is actually a specific type of epilepsy. It means that they're just so sensitive to light that at certain intensity levels, it can overwhelm their system. And then, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's that part with Prophet Muhammad. It's not necessarily like a bad thing either. You know, there's kind of so much like, fear around these transcendental states of consciousness. I remember when I was in a Reiki training or I was in some other training, but my Reiki teacher was there and she went out of body in the training and was just like a child, you know, like she was just not in her body. We were like trying to carry her to the car. And I was like freaked out. I'm like, what is going on right now? Like this person. And she was having this mystical experience outside of her body. She was like in a different, you know, like state. And, um, but on the 3d level, it just looked like she was this child who had like no control over her body and was like, and it was, it was super weird to see. So I think as a culture, we're not really used to these mystical experiences where people really, really go far. And, um, and so it's not, um, you know, like labeling it as being traumatic is definitely like a label that we're putting on it and it's not necessarily how it needs to be understood. Um, that being said, you know, you know, it's really rare that someone would have a seizure from the Lucia light. If someone feels uncomfortable looking at, um, a video of flashing light, then, you know, I think it's good to look at, you know, first, like, well, what makes you uncomfortable? Is it this collective fear around the seizure situation or like, actually, does it feel like something in your stomach is like, woo? you know, like feels actually uncomfortable with flashing light because I, I, I've met people of both types and, you know, either one's fine. You know, if you don't feel called to it again, there's like a million other therapies that you can go try. Um, so we're definitely not trying to convince anyone here to do anything. Um, um, but yeah, that being said, it's not necessarily like a, a bad thing. If you were to have a seizure, it's very rare that someone would have a seizure with the Lucia um, and we, you know, we have had a few people have seizures, very few over, you know, 10 years that we've had, um, that had never had a seizure before. Um, so they didn't have epilepsy, but they had a seizure in the light. That's why we recommend that you definitely do the first few sessions with somebody. But, um, those people who have had those, uh, seizures have had life changing situations afterwards. So it's been a catalyst for their life to dramatically change, you know, and, um, so again, like what's good or bad, like nobody's had outstanding issues ever, like from having, you know, anything with the light mm -hmm. and, um, you know, seizure can be intense in the moment, mostly for the people who are holding space for the situation. Um, but in the end, you know, it's, it's a huge release and kind of like reset for the system. And, you know, obviously people with, um, ongoing epilepsy that, can be triggered into having seizures all the time. It can be very intense for them. And I definitely don't want to 
you know, suggest that that's like something, you know, enjoyable for, you know, these you know, people, I think. Um, but also I think it's just helpful to and healthy to kind of rearrange our perspective and, you know, refresh our perspective on what's happening in these situations and uh, how rare it is and how it's even then with the light, not something to necessarily be afraid of. Mm, those are great points. Yeah. The overwhelming factor with your light fascinates me. Uh, like I'm so sensitive to it and I'm still building up. I remember when I first got it, I, uh, put it on the DMT program <laughs> and, uh, and I think I tried it for like 10 seconds and I was like, okay, I know I cannot handle even 10 seconds of this. And, uh, people came over to do work on the house and I just, I ran that program just hitting the floor and we were just, the guy was just gazing at it on my floor in my living room. And he was starting to zone out, just seeing the DMT program flashing on the floor under the light. He wasn't even under it. And um, so it's very powerful. And yeah, I've felt like if I, if I try a strong uh, you know, song or program on your device, I definitely feel overwhelmed. And usually I'll just kind of look away. But I've found like the music I play really matters like if it's really intense, like techno, like really energizing music, it definitely amps it up and makes it more intense. And then if it's more like folk music, like you said, acoustic, relaxing, I find I could take a lot more. So I think playing with the music is kind of important too, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, light and sound are so intertwined and music is definitely interrelated with the light. You know, um, you can actually have kind of like a listening party experience to your you know, favorite music, as long as you really resonate with the lyrics, I would say, because it's going to go pretty um, deep into your into your psyche there. But it's it's something so music really changes us and moves us. And so therefore, like how we're perceiving music is kind of like the ambiance to our light session. So, you know, any as everyone says with uh, psychedelics, you know, it's a uh, set and setting is going to totally change your psychedelic experience. And the same with the light, like how, how you set the room, like, do you feel comfortable being alone there? Is someone going to interrupt you? Are the dogs barking at the door? Is, you know, there's so many different variables here to how your experience is going to be. And, and music is also uh, a big part of that. of like choosing something that, you know, is relaxing or that you really resonate with. And so we generally recommend actually music without, words at all just more kind of like you know relaxing music or nature sounds or just kind of like frequencies um i can send you some a playlist that i have with some cool tracks but um yeah just so that your brain isn't thinking you know we don't attach to the lyrics more than anything um because that usually the brain loves that it's like oh did you just say some words like i can play with that um wow yeah I, i'd love that yeah that's that's really interesting about the lyrics going deeper because i've been playing around the sensory deprivation pretty intensely for the last year and um my friend max that sells the tanks he says that they use it actually for um like brain entrainment or like um like speed learning because you in a sensory deprivation environment you're you're so receptive so you just soak it all up so i'd imagine it's pretty similar with your light so you just you're open right <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're, you know, you're open. It's kind of a conversation between your conscious and your subconscious in a way. So it is a powerful time to, you know, receive information. We actually, you know, also you can do like guided meditations with the light or even kind of like self hypnosis or, you know, there's a few hypnotherapists who work with the Lucia to really help people go into that. And, you know, for the people who are afraid of this concept of hypnotherapy, it's it's really just working with your subconscious. It's, you know, it's helping, you know, work with these old patternings and, and ways of beings that are rooted so deeply inside of you that it kind of takes going to the subconscious to clear, you know, your mom's voice telling you you're not enough or whatever um, it is that's still like lingering there in your, in your consciousness. So yeah, definitely can take things really deep. And, you know, and again, without lyrics, I think it also can just be super helpful to just kind of let go of that for a while. It's like, oh, what's life like in silence? <laughs> we often forget that. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, we're like overstimulated, and especially with social media. Um, 
That's fascinating with hypnotherapy. I've been playing with subliminal messages again. It's been like five or six years. And so maybe I'll try those with it. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, there's, it's, it's amazing how we can rewrite our, our consciousness and, and really choose how we want to be. You know, I think a lot of people, it's like you can say your I am statements in the morning every day, but you know, it's, you're not getting to these deeper, unwinding these deeper you know, traumas or issues or things that are like around why it's so hard to find abundance or find love or find peace, then we really can't just call it in through a I am statement. It helps, but you know, we got to work on these deeper layers and, you know, and that's another way actually that Lucia is and the nervous system are integrated with trauma is that, and I think for me, my huge experience was that, you know, again, with the nervous system, when you've been through a traumatic experience or you're dealing with a past trauma, it doesn't have to be a current trauma. Um, and, you know, for some people, it can be a past life trauma. <laughs> I don't know, going far out again. Um, but, you know, whatever it is, or a lineage trauma, you know, we, we were in our grandmother's womb. So it's like amazing the kind of stories that we carry. Um, but yeah, when we start really doing this deep work, um, they can actually, these stories can actually be held in parts of the nervous system, you know, and when we just go to sleep at night and just going along um, these, we're not going through these variations of like these little slow steps of unwinding and going deeply. So we just kind of skim over it. And then when we're doing, you know, the float tanks or any, like even getting a massage or, um, taking a walk in nature and just, you know, taking a little nap when you just lay down and let your brain like slowly kind of relax. Then we have a chance to kind of unwind some of these, uh, these traumas. So sometimes people even see things they experience, like it's witness a traumatic experience from outside of their body or from a distance during a light session. And, um, you know, some people ask like, Oh, can you have flashbacks? Um, I haven't ever heard of anyone having a, a flashback, but it's more of actually just having a, a viewing of the experience from a different perspective, um, which I think would be more similar to, you know, what somebody could experience in ayahuasca or something like this, where it's, it's kind of integrating it. So it's, um, you know, these experiences that they happen to us, to that they're part of the rich tapestry of our life, you know, and it's... Um, there, there's teaching there. There's reasons why that these things happened. And, and as we forgive ourselves and forgive other people that were involved in these situations and don't see it like from the victim's stance, then, um, and then really clear it within the nervous system with these types of technologies, then we're able to really fully clear that patterning from our life. And then we don't keep attracting these similar situations. Mm. Yeah, I'm glad you uh, keep bringing up the trauma aspect because I think when it gets stored in the body, we we need modalities. And maybe you can call them permission slips. You know, whether it's like a I don't know a, a device or um, a session of something or um, you know therapy or whatever. But whatever tool someone wants to use, um, I I could see how this could be tremendous for that. I absolutely agree. I, I mean, giving ourselves that permission slip, giving ourselves that time to work on these deeper things is so important. And, you know, that's, again, it's like kind of going back to that silver bullet idea and how people who are dealing with, you know, ongoing illness and things like that, it's like, oh, well, I tried that. I tried this. I tried that. And it didn't work. And it's still not getting better. And it's like, you know, I think these moments are really a chance for us to stop everything and look at all of the layers, you know, it's like, well, hey, maybe something in your environment's not working, you know, like, maybe you have a, you know, a relational situation that's not helping, or maybe there's mold in your house, or, you know, maybe there's something in the environment, maybe there's something in the food, like maybe there's something in your emotional state, maybe you haven't allowed yourself to process that time grandma did whatever or you know like there's there's so many like layers and that's why we can't just give solutions to things because all of these systems are interrelated and you know my my real perspective is that when we have a, a sickness we can't figure out what it is or when we have these um you know situations i mean i even had a little 
scooter accident the other day. And it was just kind of like, okay, I could see this as like, oh, whatever. It's just a physical thing that happened, you know? And it's just like, or maybe what's a deeper meaning behind it? And for me, it was like, oh, slow down. Oh, slow down, you know? So I think when we can look at these deeper understandings under what happened and not say like, this horrible thing happened or I'm dealing with this horrible thing. And I understand when you're sick and you can't figure it out, it's, it's serious. Like, I don't want to take anything away from that. And I think the part of the healing process is being able to accept that sometimes in life we have to just completely stop and then start building from that foundation and and really looking into those dark closets and uncomfortable places um, if we really want to heal, you know. That's awesome. I wanted to ask you about stacking besides music. <laughs> like, um, like I have a little chi machine. It's like supposedly they like measured qigong masters energy emitting from their hands. And I put that on my thymus while I use your light. It's really enjoyable and like the relax program. Um, and I'm sure there's a million things. Uh, for a while, I was using like new calm, like ignite. It's like their energizing one, uh, neuroacoustic software. <laughs> Probably not the best combo um, with what you said earlier about the you know, how the light works with the brain states. Um, so for now, I'll just stick to lyrics free music. Um, but I can imagine using your light right before a sensory deprivation float could be incredible. Um, supposedly, that's like a Freemason kind of thing. It's like put people in darkness for three days and like put them on the sunrise. I've heard that somewhere, but uh, I think there's something to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of cool ways to kind of stack with the light. Definitely doing a light session before a float tank session is amazing. I I super recommend that. I think that, you know, there's a way you just like relax and see all these colors and get the visual cortex activated and get some blood flow to the brain, which also help, happens during light session. And then you get into the, the float tank. It's a lot easier to kind of drop in. You don't have to go through the mental chatter as much. Um, or at all sometimes. And then other things, infrared mat is really nice. Um, laying on an infrared mat with the light. I love that. Yeah. Chi machine is really good. I know there's like kind of the old school chi machines too, that you put your like ankles on and they kind of wiggle you back and forth for a little bit. That could be nice beforehand. Um, yeah, we've done PEMF mats as well. You could also work with that. Um, but yeah, anything that's working with the brainwave states, not really recommended just because it could be confusing for the body. I remember we were actually experimenting. Um, I, meet, I meet a lot of amazing characters along the way with this that are interested in the light and things. And we were experimenting with the Monroe Institute, like astral projection, um, like binaural beats at the same time as the DMT session on the light. And yeah, we basically almost gave ourselves seizures. And um, yeah, it was such a wild experience for me because at that point, at that point, I was like actually one of those people who was like the opposite of sensitive. Like when I started with the light, I was like, give me full power. You know, I was like doing the the strongest sessions possible all the time. And um, so I was like, great. So it combined the DMT with the you know, beats, but I, I remember like actually my head started moving and then like out of control, I just had to like pull the headphones off, you know, like, oh my God. But um, we were like, maybe we would like, you know, if we kept going, we would just kind of like, you know, go into like maybe like a portal machine or something crazy would happen. And and then we talked to the Monroe Institute and they're like, yeah, that's a terrible idea. Like, no, no, no. It's like, <laughs> like what actually was happening is your brain was trying to interpret two different signals at the same time. Um, so it was kind of going back and forth between the signals, which was taking me like this. Like I was like physically moving my head back and forth. So yeah, it was like, okay, one, one thing at a time. So yeah, there any, you know, stacking can help, but, um, yeah, I'm just being a little conscious of the brain waves. Um, we have, I have worked with taking like GABA supp- supplements before that's a assist with neurotransmitters um, and relaxing blue Lotus tea is a favorite of mine or really any like chamomile or anything that's um, re- like a nervine relaxing for the nervous system can be great. Um, you know, some people CBD is a thing for you. That could be nice. Um, generally we don't recommend um 
you know, if you're already working with microdosing or things like that, that's kind of a separate topic and I can't give an official recommendation on that. But um, I would just, the, oh, yeah, I think that, you know, they're very similar. So you definitely, one of the amazing things about the Lucia is you don't need psychedelics um, to have these amazing very similar experiences in the brain in terms of how the brain is shifting and developing neuroplasticity and all these things. And it was actually a study, maybe you can include in the show notes that compared the Lucialite to psilocybin and um, seeing both reported effects um, of the user at the time, and then also the brain um, response and the similarity there. So there's a similarity there already. Um, And I'll say on the psychedelic side is that I found a study once that it was kind of amazing. I was like really concerned about taking the light to festivals and things um, with psychedelics. And, you know, I was like, I can't control this. You know, my own control fears started coming up like, oh, my God, I want to create a safe space for people. Like, what if I like cause harm? You know, it's the last thing I want to do. And I found a study like I don't know who funded this. Like, this is crazy. But around with like a like a chimpanzee that had epilepsy and then they gave it LSD and then they put it under a flashing light and it didn't have a seizure and it always had seizures otherwise. And I mean, again, I'll just kind of like leave that as a dot, dot, dot other than, um, you know, just there's so much to the brain and we're all just starting to really begin to understand these things. So I think as we really tune into ourselves and really take note of what works for us, um, and be moderate with our, you know, personal experiments. I know you're a personal experimenter from listening to yourself, which is awesome. But, you know, it's like, you know, the kind of mother energy in me. And like, it's just like, be careful. Just like start slow, you know, like, yes, try what works for you and what feels in your safe zone. But just don't try, you know, like DMT is your first session or you're going to have to stop it within 10 seconds, you know, like, do things moderately and um, and just take note of how your body responds. You know, I think that's one of the things we've been really cut off from and that the the light has really helped me come back to is just like, oh, yeah, my own body awareness. Like that's where everything's centered. I don't need to look for someone to tell me what I need for my body. I can actually develop the awareness within myself to feel what I need, like feel what I want to eat and what I'm actually craving not like a sugar craving but like oh i can tell when i need greens you know and i um you know i can tell when i need water most people you know some people don't even know that you know usually it's like when you're super thirsty it's like actually that's a signal you're like in a a really deep state of need of water like there's signals before the feeling of thirst that are calling in water so i think when we can really get super aware of our body and what works for us and things like that then you know, and same with the light. How often do you use the light? There's no prescription for like, this is not a medical device. It's not like do this and get that result. It's more of like what, what feels resonant to you and what are you, um, what, what is your body responding to in a positive way? So just, yeah, just a few thoughts on that. It's really kind of tuning into yourself. Yeah. So with the, um, overwhelming thing, do you have any tips that you share with people like beyond just breathing? Is that the best thing? Cause I noticed if I start to feel like I'm too intense and you mentioned like that stomach feeling almost like a roller coaster, like I'm not a roller coaster fan. And it's like similar to that feeling that I get. Um, and I've been just trying different techniques on myself to kind of calm down and move through it. <laughs> but do you think it just, helps just doing it often like the frequency just with time you are able to let go more yeah i think i mean definitely breath is the number one way to get into the nervous system but what i would actually recommend is starting before the light session so kind of like any psychedelic experience um it's kind of the moment you decide to do it it's like it begins right the process so But if you start before by doing some deep breaths and kind of opening space for yourself and like, you know, it's amazing what five minutes of breathing can do, you know, and we rarely give ourselves that time. And I know as, you know, even someone who knows that and I do a session for myself with the light, sometimes I don't, um, 
I don't give myself that few minutes before I turn it on. I just like pop in there, turn it on and then deal with it. You know, it's like, wait, like I teach people how to like set the space. Like, what am I doing? So I think when I really set the space, set the container for myself, like think about why I'm doing it. You know, just like with food, you actually absorb more food if you just sit with your food for a second and like notice what you're eating or like when you prepare your own food, you usually digest it better. There's like all these things because our awareness actually brings so much. So if you, you know, first of all, it's awareness. Um, second of all, um, not having stimulants directly before the experience. Um, so, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, drink a coffee or something to be like, oh, I'm coming into the experience. I want to you know, really prepare, like I'm excited. And a lot of times when we're excited, we drink coffee or something. And, you know, I, I definitely drink coffee myself, so I'm not like against it, but I think that it's kind of knowing what a potent tool it is and, and, and realizing when we reach for it, when it's not actually helping us. And, you know, sometimes like nervousness, if you're nervous and then you drink coffee, it's just going to make you more nervous or more anxious. It actually it's really intense for your nervous system. So if you're like a calm like person who has like a calm morning and then it's like, I'm ready for my focus time. I'm going to drink a coffee. Then it's fine. You know, but if you're just like getting, you know, like super stressed and everything, then, you know, drinking coffee from a place of stress, then it's not going to help. It's just going to make everything more intense. So, um, you know, you can have, if you want like a, sitting with yourself for a minute, you could have a relaxing tea, like I mentioned before, like blue lotus or chamomile or something like that. Um, or, you know, just kind of pick something relaxing and to start with. And then during the session, yes, breath, like nice, deep, slow breaths. I actually like looking down a little bit in the session. Um, there's something to that that kind of brings the kind of awareness more into the self. Whereas if you're in into the body, whereas when you're looking up, you're kind of going into more of like the pineal gland or like into these higher realms, you know, so I can like make it more intense. Um, and then you can also experiment with like the lighting in the room, you know, so there's another thing where people think you have to have total blackout, you know, darkness, and then you turn the light on, but that can actually be kind of intense for your system. So it's like going from being in total darkness to this bright light flashing in your face. It's like, you know, again, there's uh, intensity junkies that are like, that's the only way I'll do the light, you know, and it's like, okay, cool. But like for the, the sensitive folks out there, like acknowledge and honor your sensitivity. Like maybe, you know, you have some light on in the room, like a gentle light or some red light in the room or something that makes you feel kind of calm and, you know, already kind of present and you can see and then, then turn the light on. So those are some tips. Oh, those are great. I'm definitely going to try that looking down thing. Yeah. Cause I think I'm focusing on my pineal gland. Why? <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to jackhammer this thing, you know? <laughs> Oh, it's so funny because we're so like our culture is just all about intensity right we're like let's go but you know and and the, a lot of the light is about intensity it's an intense light but it's it's ironic because it's kind of like i know for myself that's why i always do the demos for myself even before doing a longer session because there's moments when i'm really craving intensity i'm usually actually feeling the most sensitive and there's i don't know if it's like some kind of mix of like masochism and like or just thinking that's you know like that's been a strategy in the past that's worked even though i'm like has that ever really worked like meeting my sensitivity with intensity like i'm not really sure but there's some part of my brain that thinks that's a good idea so i think it's um you know being able to recognize that of like sometimes when we're feeling the most like intense emotions we're the most sensitive and so we need something gentle not something like super intense hmm. That's a good point. Um, this is a good one. Someone asked, what's the difference between the Lucia light and closing your eyes and looking at the sun? Um, yeah, beautiful. And like I said before, again, like you know, there's people who get upset about like, why are you making this product when you can just look at the sun? And it's like, yeah, like nobody's forcing you to buy it or even experience it. Like um, it's just one cool way. And the difference is that when you're having your eyes closed at the sun, it's just a solid, I mean, it's, nothing's really solid light, right? But like the waves and particles that are being received from the sun are like just super wide spectrum and it's just kind of like a steady flow. So it's not flickering. Um, 
I would say to make it more like a Lucia experience, again, lay under a tree with the wind blowing and you get a little sense of it. Um, and then if you want to ratchet it up in intensity, then you pick a light, like a Lucia light experience. And so that intensity really just comes from the, the flashing lights and um, the flashing lights can't be directly found in nature. I mean, the closest um, to that would be actually sitting around a campfire and looking at the fire. So that's another recommendation of one, you know, thing that you could do here is just sit at a fire and feel that warmth and feel the flickering. But the Lucia is just a much more psychedelic um, experience of that. And, you know, and really the flickering light also brings like more blood flow to the brain. And now they've been seeing kind of lots of effects with flickering light at different frequencies too, working with, um, you know, preventing Alzheimer's and like um, dementia and like lots of kind of, it just kind of keeps the brain fresh and clear in a way. Cause again, it's like encouraging the brain to find coherency and I'm not going to get into the super scientific parts of the brain in this talk today, but like, you know, on a, on a basic level, you can just think of it as kind of like refreshing and stimulating the brain. It's like, if you just sit around in your house all day, then you get creaky bones, you know, you got to get up and move and like, walk around and exercise and then the body feels healthy in the same way with the brain. If we're just kind of like in a dark space or just receiving light from like a computer all day um, or like, you know, LEDs and like bad lighting, um, we don't really have this, um, you know, the right kind of stimulation to keep the brain active and engaged or just people staring at TVs and kind of numbing out. The TV is also a brain entrainment, by the way. It's just... um, (laughs) it's not one that, you know, like, and that's why people are mesmerized. I remember even as a kid, we didn't really have TV and stuff, which was awesome. Um, now at the time I wasn't so happy about it, but, um, you know, and I remember like if someone was on watching TV or something like at a restaurant, I would just be like, like, I couldn't look away. I was just mesmerized by this like TV, you know, and, and yeah, cause it is flickering, um, at about, you know, 60 Hertz, which is, uh, so it appears solid, um, that's a, is a type of entrainment, but that's not actually very helpful for our brain to get into coherence. But it's also why, you know, the messages that are on TV, it's like as you become more conscious in your life, then you kind of consciously choose what you're watching, right? Because it's going in when you're watching it on TV, it's actually going into your subconscious on a, on a deeper level. Um, and so even, you know, shows or something, I mean, I watched um Celestine prophecies like the other night. And then my dreams were about chasing things and doing all this stuff. It's like it gets into your subconscious. And even though this is like a very uplifting and inspiring film, there was like a lot of intense scenes in there. And so that got into my subconscious. So we just, you know, choose what you eat, choose what you take in on all the levels, whether it's, you know. Yeah. Yeah. A fun guest, Adam, on my podcast said watching, uh, like action shoot 'em ups can be beneficial for trauma because you're like, you're acting it out. And I was like, so contrary to what I thought, because it's like, oh, I don't want to watch people killing each other, but some people, supposedly that could be helpful. <laughs> so they don't have yeah. to actually do it in real life, you know? <laughs> not really. I mean, I think some of that is just like not avoiding completely something too, right? When we find total resistance to it, if that was like part of your life, then like, you know, you don't have to like, shun it it's just like watch a action film with a happy ending you know because it's like trauma is not actually about what happened it's like how it resolved and that's like something we always forget we're like focus on the thing that happened but it's actually like kids fall down a hundred times but if they fall down and hurt themselves and they're in pain and no one supports them it's a trauma if you fall down and cut your knee and someone's there for you and puts a band-aid on and gives you like a candy then it doesn't even register in your subconscious as anything bad happening. So I think that's part of like how we can rewrite these narratives is it's not what happened. It's not, you know, comparing if our trauma was worse or better than anyone else's, but it's just like writing our own happy endings to situations. Wow. That's a really good point. Yeah. <laughs> it's really empowering to know that. <laughs> um and you kind of answered another question when you started to talk about the flickering. Someone asked, um, how does this not, not stress the body from the flicker effect? But we're not talking about, like you mentioned, 60 cycle per second uh, 
regular was it alternating current what we use in the in the states <laughs> um because that's that's not what you're flickering your light at right so, and it varies like widely it varies between about like four and 30 although there's some specific sessions mm -hmm. at 40 hertz uh, working more with brain for clarity purposes but um yeah, they're lower frequencies. And then again, it's like, we're not suggesting that you do this for 10 hours a day. It's the other thing, you know, it's like there are, there's a positive stress that can come um, that, you know, actually it's a, like I mentioned before initially that the little bit of stress in the beginning and then allowing the system to deeply relax. It's actually very relaxing um, for the body when you do the 20, 30, 45 minute sessions, um, your body gets into a super deep relaxation and that's because of the consistency of the, of the flicker. So it's taking you through that process of being like a little bit of stress, but then into deep relaxation. That's very like healing for the body. Wow. Okay. Tomorrow I'll have to break through the 20 minutes cause that's been my maximum. So I'll try a 30 minute or something. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Excited to hear about it. <laughs> Someone asked, um, do different perceived colors from the light relate with different parts and states of the brain? I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> to you, totally. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people ask about that. And again, I think it's like this beautiful search for meaning that we have, right? We're always looking for meaning and things. And, and it's really beautiful, but I think it just brings us back to this like concept of relative truths. And um, what I really found in the light, you know, because I was definitely one of those people like, oh, does, when we see this, does this mean that? And, you know, and like the only thing I've really been able to find is like, what does the color mean to you? You know, people are like, and, and it's amazing because, you know, for some people, this blue part and it felt like I was in the ocean and it was so peaceful. And other people like this bright blue part came in and it was so intense and it was like I had to face everything. And then, you know, like other people, red came in and it was just like stop. And like it was challenging and I was seeing the things in my life that I was resisting. And the other people like red came in and it was my root chakra and it was about grounding to the earth. You know, it's just like it's really what you make of it, just like life. It's what you make of it. And there's no direct correlation between what colors you see and like what's happening in different parts of your brain or even like, you know, what that means on any other level that anyone else has, anyone's been able to correlate. And I, you know, as I always like saying too, and like reminding people is like every time even you do the session, you're going to have a totally different experience. I mean, it, you know, people, you know, you can really resonate with certain parts of a session and make your own session from those parts with the practitioner system, which is really cool. But then even if you do that session that you created for yourself that you love, it's going to be different every time. <laughs> You're not going to necessarily see the same color and, you know, thing that you want. It's and, and that's like life. It's like, I think that a lot of times we have these amazing experiences and we're just like striving to recreate that. But really, it's just when we're present, it's like if we're not trying to recreate the past, we can actually create something even more beautiful than we knew. So staying open to like what those things mean can just enrich our lives. That's awesome. It's like dreams. Yeah, they're, a lot of the time, maybe all the time, they're not prophetic, right? They're just like subjective, like <laughs> meaning that. And uh, you opened a whole nother rabbit hole with me with the color thing. because. I've heard that whenever we have a trauma, there's like a color that gets attached to it. Mm -hmm. And so maybe, maybe I'm trying to find meaning again, but yeah, it's how a part of how this light works is like, it's helping us process these colors that are attached to different traumas. It's interesting. Yeah, totally. That's really <sighs> fascinating. You know, and then there's like the EMDR where like, you know, they say in that type of trauma healing process that you're looking in a specific direction when the trauma happened. And so if you can kind of look in that direction again, that's part of like the eyes going back and forth when you relax. So I've also tried like rolling my eyes slowly back and forth, you know, again, nice to have someone in the room in case it gets too much for you. But um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of ways you can deal with it. And, you know, I haven't even heard that color attached to the trauma. So I'm going to look that up, but it, it makes sense in terms of a frequency for me, it's all frequency, right? So it's like, what was that energetic frequency? signal that happened at that um moment that like imprinted in your field and then being able to return to that so yeah um I'll, I'll try to send you something on it it's called color recycling um yeah color recycling adam bergstrom if you just search that 
supposedly there's a lot of research to it. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, Claris, I think that sounds fascinating. I'm going to check it out. <laughs> um, well, Allison, this was so awesome. Um, you shared a lot of info and um, the website's really cool because you have research there and um, videos as well. And I think if you just YouTube Lucia Light or your name, there's a lot there too, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we have a lot. There's a print, like I have a blog there. Um, we also have an Instagram um, with different videos and things we update and yeah, lots of information out there. So feel free to reach out to if you have any specific questions. I'm happy to answer to the best of my knowledge. Awesome. Yeah. And I like that you said that you're not trying to sell a light. It's kind of like the float spa tank, like the sensory deprivation. Like not a lot of people are going to buy one, but just to go and do it at a spa or go and use your light, I think could be super beneficial. Even just one session could be life changing. Yeah, exactly. It's something cool to try. If you feel the call to try it, then I definitely recommend trying it. And, you know, that's the thing. They are, um, you know, an investment to purchase for yourself because it's made in Austria, super high quality materials. um, And just the way it was designed and everything is a is a process. Um, But if you feel called to working with it, there's practitioners all over and it's really nice actually to experience the light for yourself. I know I think a lot of these things that we kind of want for ourselves. Like, I just want to buy that thing. And then it's like, actually, if you go in with a practitioner, um, you have someone holding space for you, you get to really like be with that experience. And then, then if it's something that really resonates with you and you know, you want to work over time then purchasing, but, um, yeah, it's great to, and again, or just finding things in nature that resonate with you. So feel into tune into you and see what, see what calls you. But yeah, it's, it's so fun, all these different technologies and ways to, to work with the nervous system, with wellness, to play with light, to play with color, to play with visionary states. Um, it's pretty wonderful. So, yeah, thanks for all the work that you do, Matt, too, and bringing out different concepts for people and opening minds and challenging perspectives. And it's really, really been wonderful to be here with you. Oh, thanks, Allison. This was a lot of fun. And thank you for all that you do for the world to help people. And um This was great. Yeah, I'll put all the links below and uh, stick around as I close out the show. Thanks so much. That is all for today's show. Hope you guys have a chance to try out this therapy at some point. I really think that this and sensory deprivation floating are two really powerful modalities, and there's a lot more. But both of those modalities work with light. With the Lucia hypnagogic light, you're getting this huge influx of beneficial frequencies. And with sensory deprivation, quote, rest therapy, you're getting zero photons, which in my experience, you're able to access your inner light a little easier. And not in a super esoteric way. To me, it's very physiological. You're just able to perceive the infrared and UV light being emitted, uh, especially in your brain, uh, in a sensory deprivation flow experience. I feel like a lot of chronic health conditions are caused by a bad relationship with light. That means not getting bright light at the start of the day and midday and at night flooding your eyes and your skin with bright, artificial, high blue wavelength light. And that would be most people from what I've observed. Most people are doing the exact opposite of what they should be doing. I'll never forget my brother took me to my first Metallica concert. And this guy sitting in front of us, just as the headliners finished, The sun was going down. He took off his sunglasses to be blasted by, you know, at concerts, how it is with the super bright lights. And I remember thinking, wow, he's literally doing the exact opposite of what he should be doing. Sunglasses are not healthy for you because it gives a mismatched signal to your brain where you're blocking all the wavelengths of light from hitting your retina, which 
allows you to create internal sunscreen and it educates your body on your environment. People are blocking that signal. And then at night, they are completely unprotected from pretty much noonday sunlight that they're getting after sundown. And that really screws up the circadian rhythm. And the more I learn about serotonin and melatonin, I think a large purpose of wearing blue blockers and switching out the bulbs in your house for red, orange, and yellow bulbs is really for that serotonin detox because serotonin's not a feel good, happy hormone, it's a hibernation hormone. And to convert serotonin into melatonin, you need your circadian rhythm to be balanced. You need that bright light at the start of the day. You're getting blue light, full spectrum light, white light. And at night, you should only be getting firelight. And it just makes sense logically, right? The, most of the wavelengths in a fire are red, orange, and yellow. Yeah, there's some blue but it's a very small amount. So I was really surprised when Allison said with using this light, some people might benefit from using it at night. Like she said, that was her experience and she slept really well after that, even though she was blasting her eyes with really bright white light. And that's why I love having this podcast is it really challenges my beliefs. I'm wondering if, Allison holding on to that trauma in her body that was affecting her sleep a lot more than hormones and any of the physiological stuff. That's really fascinating to me. And that plays into Adam Bergstrom's yes, no, maybe world. And I'll never forget how he says that he drinks coffee in the middle of the night sometimes and he can go right back to sleep. And that goes against everything you hear in the natural health community because they'll say not only not eat sugar or eat anything and only consume water after sunset but they'll say don't consume caffeine after 5 p.m 6 p.m sometimes even earlier and my experience has been i can have two shots of espresso around five, six, even seven o'clock, like I did tonight. And I always sleep like a baby. So I think there's a lot more going on than we've been told, uh, especially as it relates to, quote, stimulants and caffeine. It's been so demonized, like tobacco and nicotine. And I think the picture is so much bigger. And it really comes down to why you're using something. So I didn't mean to go on a, a long coffee rant here. <laughs> I highly recommend if you have the opportunity, use a Lucia light. I've used other lights at different health conferences over the years, different flashing lights that companies came out with. And like Allison said, hers is the best. I often get asked because I speak out against the harms of supplementing cholecalciferol or vitamin D3 or rat poison. And I think vitamin D is such a small aspect of what we get from light that a more important thing is to give our brain the signal every day that it's time to open up the pharmacy doors it's time to start secreting hormones because that all happens in our brain, our pituitary gland, our hypothalamus. All of the doors open with the stimulus and the absence of light. So if you live somewhere where maybe it's gloomy for several weeks and you're concerned about depression or seasonal affective disorder, I think a light like this is definitely an investment, but if you're setting up your home as a place for healing, deep healing, and 
real health optimization, then I think it's well worth the investment. And Allison said the light should last a lifetime. So I have the home portal. It's called the N03. And just has one halogen light with four LEDs around it. And the geometry that I see when I shut my eyes and experience a session is really hard to describe. Like Allison said, it's different every time, but the colors, it's like an induced psychedelic trip. I really like what Allison said about what does the color mean to you? That there's just not a objective definition for what blue is or what green means or purple that each person will have a different experience of different colors. And I think that's really getting down to the root for me of the benefits of this device. Adam Bergstrom talks about color recycling and maybe there is more affordable, more simple ways to do it. Just saying the colors or watching a YouTube video of the colors flashing like he's posted before. I'd imagine that this is somewhat different because it's going so deep into the brain. Your eyes are shut. It's really bright. Your brain's creating the colors from the experience. I think like sensory deprivation floating, there's a lot of theories of how it's working. And I think what it comes down to is it's working in multiple ways, both on your body emotionally, energetically, mentally, and physically. It's like a total tune-up to your system. So if you want to check it out, I'll put the link below. It's luciaLightExperience.com. And I have a discount code if you decide to purchase one. The code is Blackburn, and that will save you 10%, which ends up being about a thousand bucks. So it's a significant savings. And I really love it. It's part of my morning routine. It's a really fun way to meditate, take a break from the phone, put on some good music, and you could lay under it with your partner and get both of you grounded to start the day. I think it's a really awesome tool. I think it's one of the better, quote, biohacking or health optimization tools out there. Currently, I'm just stacking it with the Chi Palm that I have on my website, which is infrasonic frequencies. And I put that right on my thymus, which is the center of our immunity. And I think that gland has been hammered pretty good from all the keto that we've done and carb restriction and fasting. And I'll probably be experimenting with different stacks. I've been really enjoying the new Troscriptions product called Trocalm, which is a mix of CBD, CBG, kava, and GABA. And that's really relaxing and that's been a really fun thing to use with sensory deprivation floating or my new calm. It goes with a lot of different things that I do, or even just going outside on a walk that should be out any day now. And if you want to check out all of my other recommended products, you can go to matt blackburn.com on the front page there. I have my featured products and one of them is magnesium hydroxide which is a really underrated supplement. It comes in a powder, but you don't take the powder straight. You mix it with cold carbonated water and people get all hung up. Does it have to be reverse osmosis? What about distilled? What about tap? What about just carbonated mineral water from the store? And the answer is you can use any of those. In my opinion, reverse osmosis is ideal, but any of them will work. And if I'm traveling and say I'm at the airport and I come across cold, carbonated, bottled water, I will buy that and I'll add some of this magnesium hydroxide powder to it, shake it up, 
try not to freak people in the airport out thinking that I'm making a bomb or something. And I'll make my own liquid magnesium that I'll sip on. And the magnesium is helping with ATP production. It's helping keep stress down. It's helping to mitigate the voltage-gated calcium channels opening from EMFs, which, you know, airports and planes are just really harsh on the body from an EMF perspective. So to fortify your body with magnesium during that time is a really good idea. So my friends over at Crucial 4 uh, sell a magnesium hydroxide that's really affordable. And if you get a soda stream or any kind of a soda maker and carbonate cold water and then add a little bit of that to it, it's not rocket science. It's super easy and it's a really affordable way to supplement magnesium. And Crucial 4 just released a cold plasma medical grade ozone generator. I actually just received it today and I'm very impressed. I've already ozonated my one liter of cold water and I've been sipping that and really fascinated right now with the clinical studies on ozone just simply for dental health, for teeth and gums which I know are overlooked in the health community, uh, especially ex-fruitarians who have had teeth pulled. I know people that that's happened to them. Their teeth fell out. They got loose. I mean, this is at a really young age. And I think the K2 deficiency and all the deficiencies really but really the vitamin K2 deficiency that we've had for our entire life really weakens the dentition and even the gum health because our saliva pH is regulated by vitamin K2. And what lowers vitamin K2? Well, supplementing D3, drinking hard water, bathing in hard water for our entire life, calcification, excess calcium, which isn't coming in in supplements like people think, or the processed foods, although some of it's from that. A lot of the calcification has been caused by hard water. So a lot of people are hyper-focusing just on fluoride, and you often hear that in the mainstream alternative health community. Oh, the fluoride is calcifying the pineal gland. And that's a really uh, basic level to be at. When you get beyond that basic level, you start to see that, well, it's not just the pineal gland that's calcifying. It's the entire body. And what's the source of the calcification? What's causing it? Is it just the fluoride in our water? No, it's more so the hard minerals in the water, the excess calcium. Just go to the store and look at these bottled spring waters, these bottled mineral waters, and look at the supplement facts. Look at the label on the bottle and see how many milligrams of calcium are in these wa drinking waters. It's insane. It doesn't just go through you. It gets stored in the tissues and it creates calcification of the soft tissue, coral reefs. And if you're supplementing cholecalciferol D3 while you're drinking, Gerald Steiner, Perrier, uh, San Pellegrino, a lot of these really trendy waters, Mountain Valley spring water, which everyone seems to be obsessed with for some unknown reason. You supplement D3 with those waters and you get hypercalcemia because what vitamin D does in supplement form, which we're not designed to ingest, that increases calcium absorption in the gut. And that will create a magnesium and K2 deficiency as well as boron. Calcification depletes a lot of nutrients in the body and it creates oxidative stress. My friend Justin over at Extreme Health Radio, it's my favorite podcast other than my own, 
we had a whole show on calcification. And I also was on a show talking about lipofuscin. We still have to cover fibrosis, but we did a deep dive into calcification recently. And that was really fun. The picture is so big. And in all of my research on calcification, I've never seen people highlight the D3 problem, the vitamin D supplement problem, because that is a huge contributing factor to the calcification epidemic that we're seeing today. So another tangent back to the Ozonator. Uh, I love it. I think it's really affordable for what you're getting, really compact. You're able to travel with it. There's a little bit of a learning curve to it, but they offer training. And to me, it seemed overwhelming at first to get oxygen tanks. But if you can find a welding store, then it's really easy to buy your own O2 tanks. And then you hook that up to the ozone machine. Because I learned this in the last year that you want pure oxygen. Because if you're just pulling from the air, you get nitrogen impurities called nitrosamines. And so to use nearly 100% pure oxygen, you make cleaner ozone. And that's especially important if you're doing rectal insufflation or IV, which I think is very intrusive and unnecessary unless someone's on their deathbed. Even then, I think just drinking ozonated water and the rectal insufflation, which to me is more comfortable than sticking yourself with a needle is the way to go. So check that out. I'll put the link below to it. If you use the discount code Blackburn, you save almost $400 on it. And I think especially in these times, it's important to have some tools at home because we're getting hit pretty hard. Uh, I think it's sinister and intentional. I think that's obvious (laughs) at this point. So to have some really heavy hitters that you can use uh, effective devices to combat these poisons, I think it's a great idea. And if you want to purchase MitoLife products, you can head over to MitoLife.co and we're slowly coming back in stock. The goal is by Christmas to have most of the things in stock for you guys. Um, the updates are posted frequently, pretty much daily on the MitoLife Instagram page. So if you're on there, check that out and we give updates there. Um, But for now, the resiliencies in stock, there's a few of those left. That's a whole food vitamin C product. It's a mix of Camu Camu, Amla, and Rose Hips. And there's been a lot of misinformation about vitamin C This idea that you have to megadose it and you have to megadose the shell of it, ascorbic acid. When the fact is we don't need thousands and thousands of grams of it. If you take the whole food version, three capsules a day would be plenty. And you could experiment with taking six or nine or 12 or trying different dosages. I've done that. It's a food. So it's safe, unlike ascorbic acid, which is not safe in my opinion, uh, especially to megadose it. It has really detrimental effects on ceruloplasmin activity, that ferrooxidase enzyme that works with our iron recycling program. Taking ascorbic acid will screw up your ability to utilize oxygen. So with all of these oxygen therapies, like I'm a fan of hyperbaric oxygen therapy, ozone therapy. Whenever we're putting more oxygen into the system, we want to make sure that we're getting sufficient retinol, vitamin A, which dairy is an amazing source of retinol, or beef liver or organ meats in general. Ruminant animal livers are great. And copper, which you get from shilajit, whole food vitamin C, potatoes, berries, bee pollen, 
oysters. And like a frequent guest on the show, Morley Robbins has said, copper is something that you need to consume daily. It's not zinc like you've been taught. Also want to shout out the Mitolife Academy. I put a lot of time and energy into that. That's a private YouTube school. I post four videos a month and one live Q&A where you can ask me anything. And that's really fun for me, uh, making health optimization videos. I often share information that's too sensitive for social media because we're in the age of extreme censorship now. Um, I also have a Telegram where that link is in my Instagram bio. Uh, The censorship's getting pretty crazy. I was blocked from doing live videos on Instagram uh, for several weeks now. And like I've said before, we must be really powerful if they're cracking down this hard. And there's so many channels, it's impossible to stop this information from getting out there. But I appreciate it if you share this show with your friends, with your family. And if you can't find a show on iTunes, check out my YouTube channel. It should be under Matt Blackburn. And usually you can find old shows there on YouTube. So that's it. See you guys next Friday. Stay supercharged. Stay supercharged.